You're very welcome back to the programme. Now, the past week has ignited controversy surrounding the training of priests at St. Patrick's College in Maynooth. While those defending the college have said that many of the allegations are anonymous and don't stand up, the voice of current and recent seminarians has largely been absent from the debate. Now, I am going to be speaking shortly to the Maynooth president, Monsignor Hugh O'Connolly. But firstly, our reporter Brian O'Connell has spent the past week speaking to seminarians, both current and recent, and some of them have agreed to speak out for the first time. Uh, Brian joins me now. Brian, what have you heard? Well, right throughout the week and indeed last week, I've been talking to a number of current, recent and past seminarians about concerns that they have about the seminary in Maynooth. If you remember, we did a report here on the show a couple of weeks back on the number of parishes without priests. And we referenced how few vocations there were in Maynooth. If, for example, you compare it to national seminaries in some other countries and even in some um, other orders here in Ireland, for example, the Dominicans are doing quite well in terms of vocations. So some priests began to get in touch in confidence after that broadcast and said, look, you really need to look at some of the reasons why vocations are down. And some of them sent me accounts of their time in Maynooth. They referenced sexual activity, uh, a straying, as they would see it, from official church teaching in some areas and a culture that they said wasn't positive. And Brian, it certainly hasn't been easy to get the, the priests and seminarians to speak out, has it? Very, very difficult. On the one hand, I can see why there may not be concrete evidence or reports of the kinds of things we've heard about this week in terms of sexual activity, because many of the seminarians I spoke to were really afraid of being identified and they were afraid of being reprimanded if they were identified. Now, I did interview two people. One of them is a current seminarian and the second is a man who left in recent months. Um, And I want to start with the second uh, man. He studied theology initially in Maynooth and then he went on and joined the seminary. His name is Francis McLaughlin. Francis is from Leitrim. He's 31 years old and he's a man who takes his religion seriously. Um, He felt he had a calling and joined the seminary in 2013 and he left at the end of May this year. So just a couple of months ago, he decided really that it wasn't for him in the end. I'll talk a little bit more, Keelan, about why he left shortly, but he first started talking to me about the general atmosphere in the seminary and one of the issues that he felt was that the seminary was not sticking closely enough to church teaching and he talked here firstly about the culture he experienced. The advice you would constantly from all priests all nearly laity as well as keep your head down in seminary don't don't rock the boat. I suppose the perception is given if you come across as too Catholic or yeah that you that you will uphold all church teaching then your vocation could be at risk because there might be a misconception that as a young Irish male that you felt the seminary wasn't liberal enough or didn't match societal uh, changes enough but in fact it's the other way around yeah you'll get very few seminarians now who will not accept every church teaching and that's it in one sense it it, it makes sense too like no man or I suppose women, if they're going into religious life, is going to commit themselves to something that's a bit watery or mushy. Are you surprised at some of what's come out? In regards to homosexuality, like from my experiences of being as an undergraduate and as a seminarian, like I can see and I, I have my evidence for it that uh, there is a, a, an attraction for men with same-sex attraction to the seminary. And I can I can line out all the the people I've met that have... Sh- I've just that proves that. And then this was what follows on from that is the church came out then in two thousand five with a document, you know, that that stated that seminarians or a man wishing to enter a seminary couldn't have same sex attraction. I I see that not being upheld. T- the teaching is very clear: a man with same sex attraction, or or if he's you know engaged in homosexual acts or supporting the gay culture, he, he can't be in seminary. Are you saying that it's almost tolerated, that there's a blind eye turned to it in a way, or that it's not tackled, basically? I said there would be a blind eye turned to it, and on that document, I don't believe is is being upheld. Um, because some people listening to this will say, what's the problem? Why is homosexuality an issue? That is the church teaching, the church discipline, that a man with same-sex attraction can't be a seminarian. And the reason for that is because it sees that the man doesn't have a, enough I use the term effective maturity.
You're very welcome back to the programme now. Just before the break, we were hearing uh, from Brian O'Connell, who had spoken to a former and uh, current seminarian at uh, Maynooth College. I'm joined now by Monsignor Hugh Connolly, President of uh, Maynooth. Uh, good morning, Monsignor. Thank you very much indeed for coming in to us uh, morning, here sir. in studio. Um, Monsignor, you'd have to say it is fairly disturbing what we just heard, particularly from the seminarian who is currently in Maynooth. He says it is not fit for purpose. He says there is a culture of fear. And he said that he himself alerted authorities to um, a witnessing of uh, a sexual act between two seminarians or two people who were in the seminary and uh, it w- nothing was done. Well, first of all, I have to say that a culture of fear is simply not compatible with a uh, seminary life and we do everything we can to make the culture one that is open and honest and where a person, I suppose, very honestly prepares for a celibate uh, lifestyle. So for us to perhaps nail one or two things that have been said there, clearly, if anyone is not living celibately, they shouldn't be in the seminary. There is simply no reason for someone to be in formation preparing for a celibate way of life if they're not living celibate. And do you believe there are people in Maynooth who are not living celibately? I have no uh, reason to believe that. I do know that... Why do you have no reason to believe that? We've heard about people being on Grindr. It's It's a gay dating app. Well, what we have to say there is that as soon as something like that comes to our attention, uh, we will challenge uh, the individual who is uh, living uh, in a non-celibate way. So it is but hang true. On a second. Will you? Because w- what we have heard is that people are saying if things come to your attention anonymously, well, then they are dismissed. Uh, actually, that's not quite. That's not true at all. Because we did get some very difficult stuff to process this year. It has to be said, where names were named in anonymous, and we actually brought this to every single person named in those anonymous letters, and we gave them a very uh, clear and very uh, robust opportunity both to engage with us and also to tell the truth, which I'm quite sure they did. And so you got I anonymous a- allegations. You went to the people named. Mm-hmm. They said, "No, I didn't do that." Was that the end of the investigation? Well, it was. It was. It was difficult to go back because, in the best situation where you have a complaint, you then have an opportunity to go back and say to the to the complainant, "Could you please expand on some of the points you make?" It's so difficult when there's a terse line which says baldly uh, some, something in in one sentence, and I so it's very difficult to challenge a person around that. But we did do that, and we also made a full report to our trustees. So you're that. saying you are happy that there are no seminarians who are engaging in a non-celibate lifestyle, be it homosexual, heterosexual, whatever. Well, let's uh, just be realistic about uh, life as you prepare for priesthood. These are young and sometimes older men who come to formation and who discern the life of um, uh, of a priest. It can happen that during that course of formation, a, a guy falls in love, uh, perhaps during a, a summer, and he will, in the in vast majority of cases, he will simply come forward to his bishop or to us or to the formation staff and say, "Look, this is not working out." So, I'm not I'm not unrealistic. One has to be completely realistic about where these people are coming from. These are coming from the world we live in, not from some unreal world. And they're people with needs, and clearly, not everybody is suited to a life of. Celibacy. I think I suppose what we're hearing about and the allegations we're hearing about are somewhat different from yes. somebody falling in love yes. and wanting to engage in, in, a, in a relationship. I mean, I know um, we have seen correspondence here between between yourself and um, the editor of the Catholic Voice. He said that he alerted you to um, an anonymous letter he was sent or email he was sent that actually had a picture of somebody who is alleged to be a seminarian in Maynooth College on the Grinder app that he went down to show it to you. Mm-hmm. And at that point, you said, I don't want to see it. This is an anonymous missive. I am not going to engage in it. And unless you get the person to come forward to me, I'm not dealing with that. Is that accurate? No, that's not accurate. What did you fact, say? It's a very... I have the letters here. You yeah, say, I do not um... consider it appropriate for the college to enter an arrangement to receive material about a student from a third party such as yourself who has no personal involvement in the origination of the material. And that's the difficulty. It's the origination of the material because... But did you or did you not look at the picture that he had been sent of an 11 
alleged seminarian of yours on Grinder. I asked him if he would uh, if he would send it to the bishop that was that the relevant bishop, and he said he couldn't do that. I asked him if he would send it to me, and he said no. I want you to see it on my phone, and I said I don't think that's appropriate. Why? Why did you not look at it? I mean, it would have been look at a picture. Is he or is he not a student at the college? Was it not in your interest to know? It would be so easy to uh, perhaps defame someone in, in front of other people and uh, simply not be in a, in a position to maybe make any comment. Who was he defaming him in front of? He, he was going to show him to you and his. Uh, because in fact it was in the context of somebody else being there when he when he raised this with me personally. A colleague of yours was present right, at the same time. Exactly. Could you not have asked the colleague to leave and had a look? I mean, did you? I'm not sure that it's the proper way to do things because, quite what honest, is the proper way. The proper way to do things is to have an opportunity for that kind of material to be brought before uh, in, in CAM and uh, to be looked at and to see is there. And in fact, I think in, in that particular instance, uh, the photograph was, complete, was not conclusive at all. But now you said I would require to. So you did see it, did you? Then I have. I am surmising that something I've subsequently seen may be what he was re- referencing, but I'm not sure of that. And how did you subsequently see it then? If you refused uh, to see it, unfortunately, the these place? these things appear through the blogosphere and so forth. Okay, so so here we do have an example of somewhere where you were offered information. Mm. Nobody was pretending that it was cut and dried. It was an anonymous letter. It was an anonymous photograph. But you chose not to see it. That's not quite true. I did ask if he would send it to me separately, but I didn't want to make any comment in front to him directly so that one has to remember this. You didn't actually. You said, I would require to receive such material directly from the person who is able and willing to attest its origination and authenticity. He was not able to do that because he had received it anonymously himself. See, this is the difficulty with all of this anonymous and innuendo and receiving things. But it looks like a smokescreen. It looks like an opportunity. It's like, how can I, how can I find a way not to engage with this? Well, I'll just say I don't engage with anonymity. Well, it is, is, isn't it so difficult when um, we know that we, we're, we're realistic. We know what happens out there, that people can so easily uh, put someone's picture on a Facebook, put someone's picture m- maliciously. I was had no context of where that photograph had come from. Absolutely. I knew it was from somebody's phone. It can be interrogated, though, can't it? I mean, exactly. you don't just put your head in the sand. No, say, the way to interrogate it, though, is not on a corridor, walking down a corridor with, with a third party who might actually write, you know. But why didn't you ask him to come back to you then? With that, the photograph another time. I mean, you said very clearly in this letter, I'm not going to take it from you. I've got to take it from somebody able and willing to attest to its origination and authenticity when you knew that wasn't possible. I didn't know that wasn't possible, actually. He said, Anthony I will go back to them. I, he said, I will go back to them and see if that's possible. So, uh, you know, I was, I, I, I was not aware of that latter dimension that, that simply isn't possible. Uh, I, I and when you became aware of that, did you then say, OK, I'll take a look? At that stage, I think we're we're talking about quite recent times. So I think that other picture has been in, in, doing the rounds in the blogosphere. And Monsignor, I mean, the wider picture here, there has been a lot of coverage about this mm. this week. We've heard numerous voices who and uh, here, a seminarian currently in the college talking about this culture affair. What has actually changed over the past number of days? Are any extra investigations underway? What are you doing within the college to, for example, deal with the fact that one of your own students at this point is so unhappy and another former student felt he had no option but to leave? I I would say that it's actually a good thing to leave a seminary when you feel it's not for you. I think that's something that's healthy in any seminary and uh, actually in in, in the instance of Francis, I think he took a good decision and he discussed that and shared it with us. Is What are you doing differently after the revelations of this week? Well, first and foremost, perhaps just to say, Keelan, the seminary is on vacation, so not very much is actually happening physically in seminary, but what we are doing currently as a team who are in charge of formation is looking at all of those structures, especially the structures around around the complaints procedure, which is a very robust and good plans, complaints procedure. I think it represents best practice. There are lay people on that. There are no clerics on it, by the way. The representation of people on that are people who come from law enforcement, from safeguarding and from arbitration and adjudication. It's and a are very, very seminarians very... aware of it, though? I emailed... That's what Brian said. He said he had come across seminarians who were unaware that there was any kind of official complaints procedure whereby they didn't have to go to yourself or their bishops. Well, and that's so important that they know that there is a panel and a designated person and the people with the skills who can look at this and who are nothing to do with the seminary. They're not employees of the college. And every student at the beginning of the year, there's an introductory course 
uh, this information is given to them. It's also in the college calendarium. It's also referenced in the website. And this year, because of the particular sets of circumstances that we have discussed here, I emailed every single student, reminding them of how to do this. So I think there are some elements of... Uh, which I have to say to uh, Vox Pops there, who, which really I do not believe are representative of our assembly community, but I do. Well, you might not believe I, they're representative of many, but they, they are two no, they're important. Absolutely. honest voices. And Absolutely. one of these voices, the, the second voice we heard there, says that he himself was part of a reporting team of two who were, again, they were reporting allegations made by another person because the, the person who was who allegedly witnessed a sexual act taking place was too scared to come forward about it. Now, he says he brought that forward. There was an investigation and the upshot of that was that the man who said he saw the act taking place was asked to leave. Are you familiar with this case? I'm familiar with that case, yes. So what, what's your version of events there? Well, it's, it's, it's simply a, a case that really what could have what turned into a rather long-winded uh, episode could have been resolved within a few days if the first party had simply come forward. And uh, when we asked... So why did you ask that first party to leave? Uh, quite honestly, there was a degree of immaturity around how this uh, matter uh, went out into the seminary community. A number of people were <laughs> very clearly identified and in fact when the investigation was concluded it was very clear that the young man didn't have the clarity that was initially there when he felt that he had witnessed something. So it is clear from what you're saying there that he was asked to leave because of this incident, because of him witnessing this incident and bringing it, the way in which he brought it to attention within Maynooth. There are a number of different possibilities around uh, engagement with formation. Uh, asking someone to leave is, uh, you know, is one of those options. In fact, in this particular option, it was a case of uh, what might be termed as a suspension of a, quite a short period of time in which the young man would continue his studies and we did offer accommodation within the college for him to do that and just to finish out the year in that way. It was basically also, in some sense, for the health of the community and for himself, because he obviously was somewhat apprehensive. The whole thing took far too much, too, too, too much time. Okay. And we felt that for him, uh, it was a healthier situation for him to be outside Philippe, the college. You'd have to say the optics of that will be a young man brings an allegation, is asked to leave. I think the young man himself, were he here today, would say, because he did say it in his own words and with great clarity to us, I didn't actually see this. OK. So, you're, so he made a, a call on what he felt might have happened uh, behind a closed door. OK, so your version is that he backed down on the, on the allegations. Not so much that. Uh, not so much that. It's more that he, f he surmised that something was happening but when it was eventually put to a more robust scrutiny, he was unable to say that, in fact, and there was, I have to say, the other parties involved had a very plausible and reasonable context okay. by comparison. So he wasn't able to prove it, I suppose. And, and, Just, they, and they also were very, very capable of robustly defending it. And it, just, I mean, in conclusion, OK, at this point, this week, we have seen um, Archbishop Dermot Martin. He's withdrawing three seminarians, sure. his seminarians. We have seen more and more allegations coming out. I've asked you what's changed. You've said that you have a robust procedures already in place. Is anything going to happen because of all of this? Or is it just, listen, we'll just keep going? No, you can't just keep going because the nature of, of formation is that you have to always reform it. That's absolutely true. And uh, I think we get a, a good opportunity now. In fact, I mean, nobody wants to deal with these things in the a full glare of publicity. But if there is a good thing that comes out of this, it's an opportunity for all of us who are engaged in formation to sit down and look at and say, well, how can we address issues when people are afraid to do something? Quite honestly, Keelan, one of the talks I give every year to seminarians is please, please don't listen to those who say you must keep your head down, as Francis mentioned in that particular interview. You must play the game. That's no good. We want people who are out there to serve the gospel, to serve the church, to serve the people of God in the parishes, but to do so honestly and with courage 
and people who really... And to know they won't be asked to leave the seminary if they can't actually prove the allegations that they believe to no, be No, I true. don't think it's, it's as simple as that. I think because ultimately, if, if there is a concern, that has to be brought to the appropriate authorities. And really, what this unhappy episode has shown is that if the reporting had been done right at the start, and remember, people going into parishes have to know how to report appropriately. It's so important, given okay. where we've come from in Ireland. OK, Monsignor Hugh Connolly, thank you very much indeed for coming into us this thank morning. You, thank you. Thank you. Today with Sean O'Rourke on RTE Radio 1.